instructing time. Yes, yeah. All right, so let me um, remind you a little bit about what we were doing last time. So I was talking particularly about the uh, Ozone Frank model. So, um, so the unknown is this unit vector field N, which gives the uh, mean orientation of the rod like molecules. And, um, and you see here that the, that the integrand is a, is a quadratic gradient of N, but it has a couple of N's appearing there. And those constants are called the Frank constants. Uh, and the different terms have different interpretation. Actually, I don't know. Come back to this remark. Um, maybe last, night, because last night I was uh, uh, having an email exchange with everyone here of Virga, and uh, uh, I learned something which I'll tell you. Okay, this is the minimization problem. We want to minimize the integral subject to some boundary conditions. And, um, and there were these Ericsson inequalities that, that kept the W bounded below, but no negative. And then um, this was the function space we would use H1 uh, with uh, H1 maps from the um, region of Omega to the sphere because it's a unit vector. And with these important identities, this was, the, this was a remark that when these constants are equal, that's the equal that's the K2 then you get this uh, energy functional for harmonic maps. I talked about orientivity, I'll skip that as well, because we, it turned out that in a simply connected region, you don't worry about this uh, issue of orientability. I'm uh, sorry, so you can say this standard ozone trend model, so N now is a, is a, is a vector, a unit vector field. And we calculated the Euler Lagrange equation in the, in the usual way. And we got, um, well, a weak form here. Uh, and uh, that's the, the weak form of, of, the, of this Euler Lagrange equation, which you can, so normal Euler Lagrange operator. But with this projection applied uh, to it, and that's because n is a unit vector, and it's equivalent to uh, introducing a, a Lagrange multiplier for the constraint uh, n squared equals one, and then you get uh, a lambda x uh, times n on the right hand side. Okay, so that's where we were last time. And um, well, the question is how can you solve these equations? There are there are a system of of, of nonlinear uh, PDE, and there's also a, this constraint, which is an extra sort of difficulty. Well, the first thing you might think of is well, you know, are there some exact solutions like that? And, and the question of what smooth N of X is, um, there are that are solutions uh, to the Euler Lagrange equation of all values of the. Frank constants, those, those, those um, uh, director fields are called universal solutions. And uh, Erickson was the um, first person to, to ask this question, and, and some of he solved it, uh, and uh, it was repeated sort of by Marix. And the answer is the following that um, the, the universal solutions are either constant vector fields, or that very interesting, or those that are orthogonal to families of concentric spheres or, or, or concentric cylinders, or pure twists, which in a suitable coordinate system uh, are like this. The, 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 um, the director is planar and it twists as you, as you go up. Or there's an interesting other one, which is that planar fields that form concentric or Coaxial circles. So planar fields are ones which n1, which say n3 is zero, and n1 and n2 are just functions of x1 and x2. So everything's combined uh, to a plane. 
Okay, so that's a lot of work to get there, actually. Uh, some of the conversations that are going to come. In any case, um, one of them, one of the, one of the families was uh, a vector fields that are orthogonal to families of concentric spheres or circles. And one of those um, universal solutions is the so called hedgehog. Uh, which is uh, given by n of x is x over norm x so is pointing radially outwards uh, from a point, and that, and that represents a point defect. Uh, so that's one of the kinds of defects you get in liquid crystals. Now, of course, it's not smooth uh, because it has a singularity at the origin, but away from the origin, it is smooth. And, um, and you can calculate its gradient. And it's it's one over the radius times the projection actually of the distribution identity lines x over norm x and so x over norm x, and then you can you can square this and you find that it's uh, so this is uh, the Euclidean norm trace of the matrix transpose as itself. So, uh, so uh, uh, and that's equal to twice two over the radius square. So you can formally calculate the energy over the ball. Over the unit law, so you have the integral of w. Well, remember w is bounded above by a constant times the gradient squared. The gradient squared is two over r squared. So in polar coordinates, you, you, there's no dependence on on the on, on the surface variable. So just a four pi times a times a constant times r squared over two r squared, which is fine. So that um um. So that means that uh, n hat, this uh, hedgehog, has finite energy. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a finite energy uh, direct field. And here is a, an interesting result. Uh, many people have been told actually that if, um, if k1 is less than or equal to k2, and K3 is positive, then the hedgehog is the unique minimizer in H1 subject to its own boundary conditions. So now, let's see, so K1, what does K1 less than equal to K2 mean intuitively? Remember, K1 is the coefficient which corresponds to splay. This is a, this is a splay deformation, right? And and K2 is for um, twist, and K3 is for bend. So what this is, K1 that being less than equal to K2 is saying that it's easier to splay than it is to twist. Now, what's very interesting about this uh, result is that you don't have to assume that K1 is less than equal to K3. In some kind of earlier versions, that was, that was done. But, but you only have to, to, to assume that it's easier to splay. And uh, then it is to, to twist. And the, the bending somehow takes care of itself, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique minimizer. It is a minimizer and it's a unique minimizer. So I'm going to give a, a proof of this, which I found with um, Epifanio Vega. It's not, it's not um, well, the, the, the existence part um, it follows this you know, beautiful idea of Fenwa Lin, and, um, and it's also uh, the actual. This was actually stated and proved by who? He was a student of David Miller. He's still in mathematics. Okay, so anyway, the, the, the observation that we make, which, which just makes things a little bit quicker, is that if K1 is less than equal to K2, then this inequality holds. And the, and, the, and the trick is to just notice that we can apply the Erickson inequalities to this. We, we imagine that this is a liquid crystal. And, uh, and so uh, K3 is zero, there's no term in N cross per N squared. K24 is K1, so we have, um, we have a 2K1 here. Uh, and, and, and so by the Erickson inequalities, uh, K1 is less than equal to K2, and, uh, and they're both less than equal to K24 is. Is uh, is uh, uh, one. So um, we have um, um, okay. 
and 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 so um and so uh, we 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 have um that uh that i i of n is um well uh the, we ignore the saddle stage term because the um because the um, uh there's an old Gaussian and we've got we've got um fixed boundary conditions, right? So um so I've thrown away the subtle state and now I can use this inequality up here uh, to show that this plus this is bigger equal to 2k1 times um we got a half of course which is tensile times times div n squared minus trace squared n squared and um k24 is uh is uh, is 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 k one uh, and um, um, and um, and so um, the the since, since this is a non Lagrangian um, the um, the uh, and n is equal to n hat of the boundary because that's what we're assuming therefore this integral is equal to the integral of n hat, but that's actually exactly equal to i of n hat because the curl of n hat is zero, so you don't have these terms, and the divergence of, of n hat is twice the gradient of n squared. And um, so what you what you get is uh, that by this, this trick that um, that uh, that, um, that the that the hedgehog is, is a minimum. Now, I want to prove uh, uniqueness. Okay, so, so first of all, you can, without loss of generality, suppose that omega is a ball, uh, because um, if you if you choose a ball that contains omega, some people will say it contains omega, and you um, you suppose that n is a minimum, so you let you let n sort of be n inside the ball. Inside, inside the region omega and, you, and the hedgehog outside, and of course they match because n is got to equal n hat on the boundary of omega. Then the integral of of w of n tilde great n tilde over the ball is the sum of the two integrals. This one is bigger equal to w n hat great n hat over omega, and this is the that, so that's bigger equal to that. So you see that n tilde um, is a is a minimizer. Subject to the n tilde present on the back of the ball. So you can, without loss of general, suppose that uh, that, um, that omega is, uh, is, is the ball. Now, now, from the calculation previously, uh, so, 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 um, so. From this calculation, if we have it, if n is a minimizer, then these things are equal, right? So that means that um, um, that uh, the, the, this expression is um, is uh, equal to this. So 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 we have the sorry, the sort of north is big. So, so, I, so, I, so I subtract um, um, i of n tilde from i n, and, and, and that's what's be bigger than or equal to, 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 to zero, and it's equal to, but, but, but i of n is minimized, so it's equal, equal to zero. So, um, so we get that, uh, we get this uh, inequality holds, and that's why, so I've, I've replaced the term with k2 by the one with k1. I'm assuming that A1 is less than equal to A2. Okay, so, um, but the uh, Erickson inequalities means that mean that the that the, uh, that the first that the that the, that the, that the, that the terms uh, multiplying the terms that the terms multiplying K1, that these are non-negative. So I got zero. Uh, Bigger equal to a non negative term plus a non negative term. So, they're both, so both these terms have to actually be zero. So we have that n, n cross curl n is zero. 
and then we have that this expression is zero. And now let's feed in this uh, projection and let WN be a skew symmetric matrix defined by WNB is N cross B for all B in R3. Now N is a unit vector, so the gradient of N times N dotted with N is zero. Um, that's, that's using the fact that um, Ni, Ni comma J is zero. Uh, so, so then you can compute um, the dot products in the space of matrices of the gradient of N with Pn, and that is the divergence of N, the gradient of N uh, dotted with N tends to N is zero, the gradient of N dotted with the identity is the divergence of N. The gradient of n dotted with w of n is n dot curl n, and p of n and w of n are orthogonal, and their squares are two. So calculate then the gradient of n minus a half the divergence of n of p n minus a half n dot curl n times w n squared. And so, so to calculate it, because you, you get gradient n squared. You get the square of this term, which is um, which gives you a term in divergence n square. Uh, you get the square of this term, which gives you a term in um, which is actually uh, plus a half times um, uh, n dot curl n square. Then you get cross terms, and uh, and so the p the, the p dot n times w n is, is, is vanishes. This one gives you a, an n dot curl n, which turns the minus on the plus. Times the plus half the minus, and so um, and so and, 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 and ditto with um, this dotted with this. And so you get um, you get this expression, but uh, that expression is zero. So so that means that this square is zero. So that means that uh, that the n has to satisfy this PDE. Gradient of n is half the divergence of n times the projection plus a half n times w. Now, of course, this is satisfied by, by n hat. Check. You have to show that n hat is the only solution subject to the boundary condition. So that's that's for, for some e in the sphere, let's let h of r be the n of r e minus e all squared. So we'd like to show that this means zero because. Um, that's, that's, that's saying that n is equal to, to n hat. Well, we calculate that as just two into one minus n of r e dot e. Uh, and, um, and we know that at, at, um, at r little, so the, the ball is a radius capital R. So when little r is equal to capital R, uh, we have that, um, we have that uh, um, n of, N of R is less than the boundary is equal to E. And so um, and so H of capital R E is zero. And um, the map is in in uh, N is in H1, so it's going to be absolutely continuous on almost every radius long as we step from, from zero. So we can we can we can compute the um, the derivative of H, but it's going to be minus twice. Gradient of n, I'm taking the group of r, I've got dotted with, I've got acted on e and then dotted with e. And, uh, and then you use the, then you use the, um, the, the PDE. Uh, and uh, so the, you find that the term with w of n vanishes. And this one gives you, um, uh, gives you minus the divergence of n times one minus. E dot n of r e squared, which is so you can take out the factor identity minus e dot n of r three, which is a half of h. And so you see that we have that the derivative of h is, is this expression times h. And uh, now you know that um, n is in h one, so um, that the integral of Divergence of n squared is finite, and, um, and and so this expression is less than equal to that. 
So that means that for almost every E, we know that um, that uh, the integral of g of r squared should have said r squared g of r squared is finite. And so uh, you can integrate up this equation. So you, you'd like just to write um, e by dr of log of h is equal to g. That's a bit dodgy. It's h can be zero. So, so add on an epsilon is maybe positive h. It's not negative. So this is not positive. So calculate the derivative of the log of h r plus epsilon. And that, and that um, little r is capital R. You get um, log epsilon is zero. And so um, now you take the exponential of log h r b plus epsilon is epsilon times this thing, but this thing is bounded. Let epsilon be zero. H of R and that E is uh, zero, which is what you want. So now, who proves the weakness? And he does it in an interesting way at this point, possibly in uh, the sort of connection between these two methods. Now, he shows that, well, that the smooth, the smooth N, the condition that N dot curl N is N cross curl N is zero. Means that the characteristics of x dot, so the solutions of x dot of t with n of x and t are straight lines. And so, of course, if you knew that n was that n was smooth, then that would mean that you could you could you, you just march it on the boundary of a straight line and start with normal to the, to the sphere. Uh, however, you don't know that n is that n is smooth. All you know is that it's um it's a it's a a minimizer of the uh, integral. And so he uses a partial regularity result, which is quite heavy, quite a heavy tool to use, um, which, I'll, which I'll describe later um, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, essentially the partial regularity result tells you that um, the solution is smooth except on a, on, on, on a set of, of one dimensional house which measure zero. So you, you have to, to use that to. But anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a very elegant sort of uh, idea, except it's messed up by having to, to deal with this um, regularity business. And I, and I don't know whether you can use this use this idea um, uh, right now when you don't know the things are regular. Well, so when is so that, that says that if um, k1 is less than equal to k2, um, it's a minimizer. So now. So these people worked out the second variation at, at, at the hedgehog and show that it's positive uh, if in fact k2 minus k1 is bigger equal to this negative number minus one eighth of k3 and can be negative if the opposite inequality of when, when, when n hat is not not a, not a minimizer. Um, so um, so the the, uh, the the numerical calculations that suggested that um, n hat um, uh, need not be a minimizer if k two minus k one is bigger than minus one k three, but actually some of these examples said k one equals k two. So we know that n hat is a minimizer. So these, these can't be trusted actually. And the same results on the second variation you you can you can obtain by. Um, uh, Within a class of twisted hedgehogs, the form n is a, a rotation depending on the radius times the hedgehog, where, where, the, where the rotation uh, is, um, has axis e three, so it's a rotation about e three. So perhaps um, n hat is a minimizer if this inequality holds, but that's not, that's no problem. It's a little bit surprising that we don't know. This is now many years old. It's, Question. We don't know exactly where it's going to Now, this is what I, I learned last night with the email exchange with Vega. Uh, that actually, the, the, the method that is used in this proof of taking the square of this thing can be used to prove the following orthogonal decomposition of the gradient of a general unit vector field, which was first found by Machon and Alexander. So it's quite recent stuff. And then uh, I mentioned Selinger's paper, uh, Virgat, the paper a year later. So here's the 
it's an orthogonal decomposition. So this assumes nothing apart from the fact you've got a vector, a vector field, a unit vector, a unit vector, a unit vector field. So, and, and, and the four terms are, are, are orthogonal to each other. So, first of all, you've got minus n cross curl n tensor n. Then you have the divergence of n times the projection. Then you have a half, then you have a half times n dot curl n times this w of n. And then you have a D, which is um, symmetric. N is a, is a eigenvector number. It kills, D kills N, so D N is zero, and the trace of D is zero. So you can, you, you can actually prove this using, using, using the method before. And, and it leads in turn to this decomposition of W. Uh, which uh, splits splits um, uh, W, and this is what what Salinger um, goes it's, it's the sum of sort of four independent terms. You have a K two four. You have a K three times P square, the same as L N square, and then you then you have K one minus K two four times the divergence square, and K two minus K two four times the N dot L N square. And the thing is that the Arrington inequalities, I mean, the, the Arrington inequalities say that all the, all the, um, um, uh, all, all the coefficients are non-negative. And, 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 and so it's sort of obvious, it follows obviously from this actually. So next time I teach a course, what I'm going to do is to um, first prove this and then use it to Get the Erickson inequalities and then use the method to get this uniqueness, but I didn't know it until last night. So, uh, but, but it, it's, it's a really interesting decomposition, actually. And, uh, so, well, it's amazing that it took so long to be found. Out. Okay, so now you can do the same thing with some other universal solutions, uh, for example, pure twist. So, um, so let's suppose we we have a, a, a rectangular slab with, with with height d and sides l1 and l2 and the axes are along that so the exponents are along and so on and um, I'm going to use periodic boundary conditions on the on these spaces so so that n is um uh, is the same on this space as on the that face and the same on this space as on that face. And that on the top and bottom, it's it's in the plane in the x one x two plane. So n zero on the bottom is n is n zero on the bottom, and n zero dot e three is zero, and n is going to be n d on top, and n d dot e three is zero. So um, that's sort of consistent with having a twist when you on the bottom you you your your n zero, and then as you go up. You twist to become nd on the top surface. Uh, and now it turns out that with these boundary conditions, the set of plate um, is zero. So again, we don't have to worry about the set of plate. And here's a theorem uh, which says that suppose nd is not parallel to n0 and that k2 is less than equal to the minimum of k1 and k3. So now now you see we were saying that it's going to be easier to twist than to slay and to bend. So now we, we make both assumptions. Okay. And then there's a unique minimizer, n star, so it's a boundary condition. And it's a pure twist of this form. Uh, so uh, the constants lambda and mu. Okay, and, and so the proof is, is easier than for the uh, for the hedgehog, actually. Um, so first of all, you let n star depending on x three be the unique minimizer of, of the integral from zero to d of n prime of x three square, subject to n of zero is n zero and n of d is n d, which has this which has this form. Then you you write down uh, i i i n forgetting about the k two four term. I'm just going to put the zero here is the here is the. Jose in fact form. Now you use the 
you use the identity of the gradient of n squared, that the gradient of n squared is the sum of all the terms that appear in the, in the um, ozone frank energy, um, to rewrite this as k1 minus k2 div n squared plus k2 the gradient of n squared plus k3 minus k2 n cross curl n squared. Now we assume that k2 is less than k1 and is less than k3. So if you throw away these two terms, we just get k2 gradient of n squared, which is bigger than equal to k2 n comma 3 squared. And then you, um, so that's the integral from 0 to L1, integral from 0 to L2 of k2 times the integral of n3 squared with respect to x3. And that's bigger equal to k2 integral of k2 times n3 star of x3 squared because it's the minimizer. And that is twice i of n star because the divergence of n star is zero and, and n star cross curl n star is zero. So it's u of i of n i of n star. So now, uh, what about um, existence and regularity for the uh, general frank constant? So we can use the direct method of the calculus of variations. It's um, it's uh, it's very easy. If, if, if the boundary data is 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 the boundary data of an H one function, then there is an n star that minimizes um, um, uh, the energy subject to that boundary data, and it satisfies the the, um, the weak oil of the Lagrange equation. I mean, the, you have S, you have coercivity in the gradient of n, so you can use the direct method to get a, you extract the weak field convergent substance of n1, and you have convexity with respect to gradient of n, because w is, is, is not negative. And so you, um, and so you have another some continuity, which, which if you know about the direct method of, of this variation, it's completely straightforward. And and the and, and the and the and the the order the weak form of the Lagrange equation is easy um, to get as well. Okay. Now, so we've seen, that, however, that minimizers can have point defects. There's a hedgehog as a point defect. So you can't expect regularity of minimizers, but you could hope for partial regularity. And the best known result is this one, uh, that any minimizer is analytic outside a closed set S whose household dimension is square to be less than one. So, uh, and it's not known whether S consists of finitely many points or a countable number of points, whether minimizers can have a more complicated. Uh, Defect structure. So, I can imagine the number of points per defect. Now, a lot of work in on liquid crystals uses the one constant case because that's equivalent to the problems for harmonic maps, which is a huge industry of people working on it. So, in the one constant case, this is the Euler Lagrange equation for Fasten plus n gradient of n squared n zero. And so, it's a system of course, it's written out there in the indices. So, something very special about this which which is which doesn't happen in general and that is that the Lagrange multiplier the Lagrange multiplier is minus the gradient of n squared so it's it's an explicit function and it depends only on first derivatives of n whereas in general the Lagrange multiplier you would get by by dotting the Euler Lagrange operator with n, right? And so you would get second derivatives of, of n. So there's something very special about, about and maybe this is why it's, it's so much easier, I don't know. Um, so another special feature is the one constant case is that if n is a minimizer or an equilibrium solution, and you multiply it on the left by uh, an orthogonal matrix, 
which remains a minimizer or an equilibrium solution. So that means, for example, that the rotated hedgehog, the rotated hedgehog is not the same as the hedgehog. It's really different. And so, and so this invariance tells you that the rotated hedgehog minimizes the integral in this one constant case, subject to its own boundary condition. Now, in the one constant case, there's a more precise partial regularity result in Shane and Udenberg in the phrases Colin and Lee. So, in this case, you know that there's just a finite number of possible point defects. So, n star is smooth except for a finite number of point defects located at points x, i, and omega. And when you approach one of them, it's exactly like a rotated hedgehog. Um, uh, centered at the point xi. And so you have a finite number of hedgehogs. So you have a finite number of rotated hedgehogs, essentially. East local. Okay. Now, the case of planar solutions is interesting. So a planar solution, this is still the one constant case. So, so n of x is, is n1 of x by x2, n2 of x by x2 is zero. So, no third component of n main, and the first two components just become an x1 and x2. So, that can be treated by complex analysis, which is kind of acute actually. So, z you write as x1 plus i x2, and you, and you complexify the director, so n2 of this, n1 plus i n2. It's a unit vector, of course, so it can be written in the form, in the form e to the i phi of x. Then the equilibrium equation, if you calculate it, becomes i e to the i phi times the Laplacian phi is zero. So, so, so that the equilibrium is equivalent to the linear Laplacian equation for this angle of phi. So that makes it that makes life a lot easier. And, and in particular, that means that equilibrium equations of locally finite energy are smooth. So there's no, there's no defects in this two-dimensional two -dimensional theory. And also something very interesting is if you take two equilibrium solutions, n and n, and you multiply them together as complex numbers, that gives you another equilibrium solution because, because you just add the, the, ang the angles, right? It's really, it's really simple, but really interesting. Now, let me give an example of how you can, you can use this to treat an exterior problem. So, um, so here we are in, in 2D. Now I've got a, a finite number of two-dimensional particles, objects, right? And the and the liquid crystal is in, in the in the complement of this, this region. So I've got a finite number of little maybe it's all, there's a lot of interest in machine liquid crystals for um, colloids. So here we're assuming that, the, that the, these colloidal particles are fixed, but uh, perhaps they can move. But, but this is an interesting, um, an interesting thing in, in, in terms of colloids. So, um, so the, we're going to suppose that the that the little and the I are bounded and open, sufficiently small boundaries that their closure is a disjoint, and omega is going to be the exterior domain. So R two minus the mean of the of the closures. And on each um, and on each little omega i, we're going to specify what the director has to be. So on the first one, it's got to be n one of x. On the second one, is going to be n two of x. On the n one is going to be n m of x. So what can we say then about equilibrium solutions uh, satisfying the boundary conditions, in particular about their behavior at infinity? So uh, there's a very nice trick due to Carbu in this situation. So what you do is you pick, you pick points inside the domains of the guy, AI. Actually, it's convenient to choose the first one to be the origin of polar coordinates, if you want to, without loss of generality. And you let DI be the degree of NI. So the degree is the number of times that it goes around in terms of multiple of two pi. So it, it was a constant degree would be zero. 
if it was just a normal red cup, with the, with the degree would be one. So let, let di be the degree of ni. Then he, then he claims that you can write any equilibrium solution, n tilde, as, as the product of these hedgehogs, rows to the power d1 up to dm, times e to the i phi z. And now phi is a smooth solution. So, and, and phi is a smooth solution of the Plasius equation in omega. So you see, the problem is uh, that um, phi, I mean, phi is locally a solution of, I mean, the, the capital phi is going to be locally a solution of the Plasius equation. But as you go around, it would, it, it would change by multiples of two phi. And this is a trick for, for removing those, those uh, sort of multiples of two pi and leaving you with a solution for the Plasius equation on the whole of the exterior domain. But why, why is this true? Well, uh, a rough proof is this. Look at um, n tilde of z times these things raised to the negative power d1 and negative power dm. Okay? Now, that's a solution because, because um, well, okay, this z minus a i over z, that's a hedgehog. You can multiply solutions together. So that to the power d1 is also a solution. And if you, if you have a solution, it's inverse is also a solution. So that just changes the sign of phi, right? So this is, this is actually a solution. And you check that it has degree zero. And if it has degree zero, then you can write it as e to the i phi of z, where phi is, is solves the process of phi. So it's a very you know, neat trick. And it, and it, 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 it almost trivializes this problem. So I, I, I don't go through the details, but um, uh, um, if, if, if we take some ball, uh, which is which is BR zero, which contains all the, some big ball that contains all the, all the particles, and I let X be the, the set of, now we have max remember with S1, the circle, which are, which are um, in, uh, in, in H1 of omega intersection BR for any R. And, and, and satisfy the and satisfy the boundary data. And we let k be the sum of the degrees. Then x, this, this space, so this is the, the function space we're going to work in, you can split it into, into homotopic classes, count the many of them. Um, and, and the different classes correspond to adding uh, different multiples of two pi to the boundary values of phi on each on each um, on each d omega i. And so then you Group this with work I did with students some years ago, still not written down actually. So k is the sum of the degrees, then there's a unique minute. So the, the, the total the total energy could be infinite principle. However, the um uh, there's a unique minimizer of the, of this renormalized energy where you subtract off uh, k squared over the radius square in each homotopy class. And the minute there's a unique minimizer in each homotopy class, it's a smooth harmonic map. And at infinity, it looks like this guy, uh, which has which which rotates essentially k times, right? It's a, uh, because k is the total degree, and you have an estimate of uh, it's, it's, it's the norms bounded by something over r. And in each homotopy class, there's also um, a harmonic map with uh, this being finite, with this being infinite. And it, and it attains a minimum in the whole space, uh, but the, the minimum is not uh, generally finite. I don't go through the details of this, but, it's, but it uses essentially this carbon trick. And, uh, and after that, it's not really good. And the case of non oriental line fields. So that that's, that can be handled here by just considering n tilde square instead of n for the trick for giving it non-variant. 
Okay, I want to make some remarks on, on weak solutions. So in, in the one constant case, finite energy solutions of the weak, weak form of the oil of the equation can be everywhere discontinuous. This is a, an example of really a and now minimizers are also satisfy this identity. Uh, this is got by considering inner variations of the of the of, of n. So you you, you 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 rearrange the values of n. You look at n of z of x. Z of x is is some smooth um, that is invertible and is equal to an x on the boundary. And then you then you um, you can calculate uh, such a variation, and you get this sort of energy momentum form. So uh, W of yeah, n to the minus uh, n i comma k times P w n i comma j times P j comma k is zero. So we call that dagger. So that's that's um that's a new necessary condition of the uh, of the calculus of variations. Now, smooth solutions of the Euler Lagrange equation, of course, satisfy this, but in general, solutions of weak Euler Lagrange do not. So, this is an extra, this is an extra condition, uh, which is satisfied by minimizing. It's an extra, it's an extra, an extra sort of first order condition, which is satisfied by, by minimizing. So they're called such n that satisfy this is called stationary homonym. And in the one constant case, um, solutions uh, of the weak euler lagrange equation that satisfy the stationarity condition are smooth outside a closed set of zero one-dimensional Hausdorff measures, proved by Craig Evans. So therefore, they're smoother than general solutions of the uh, euler lagrange equation. So it's been quite tricky. Situation and, and what's, what's very interesting. And so I, I won't in this course write down the dynamic equations, but the, the dynamic equations corresponding to the Ozen Frank theory are the Erickson Leslie equations. Now, solutions of, now you might think that, that, um, that, uh, that solutions of the weak oil of the Gorge equation would naturally be solutions to the uh, so the dynamic equations corresponding to zero velocity. But that's not apparently not clear. However, um, if they satisfy this, then they are, um, they do satisfy the, um, the dynamic equations with, with zero velocity. So there's a lot of interesting stuff here, which is not completely understood by the Okay, so that's point defects, but what about other Defects. Now, line defects, what about this? It's a two dimensional pigeonhole. So we have a, a vector field that points radially outwards from a line. Well, so you can write that down n tilde of x is x1 over the radius, x2 over the radius, zero. Now, r now is the two dimensional radius. Okay? And now the gradient of n tilde squared is one over r squared. But i of n tilde is bigger equal to a constant times this. And now it's the integral of r times one of r squared. So you've got a logarithm. So this is infinity. So this very natural direct field uh, has infinite energy according to the Ozen Frank theory. So this has been a subject. Ending discussion, right? Um, because you see such line inputs, right? So it's telling me that something's wrong with the Ozen Frank theory. And you see other kinds of uh, defects, um, line defects, called uh, index one half defects. So um, here's a picture of such a Field, so everything's two dimensional. And you see, see here we have a line into the screen, uh, and there's a defect there. Um, and, and, and they fail to be described as in Frank for two reasons. 
firstly, they're not orientable. Okay, so um, well, you can you can you can try and put arrows on on, on there and you find you can't do it in, in the way that they are um, which is consistent. In this sort of region you get some kind of conflict. Now we sort of know how to handle that. You you could use n tensor n instead of n. Uh, this is however uh, this is a simply connected region. Simply connected. And also the energy is infinite in every sector. So remember, I said that in a simply connected region, if you're in H1, it's orientable. But here you're not in H1. And it's and it's not oriented. So now, how would you, how could you remedy this from well, a heretical um, way of um, remedying uh, the um, two, the, the, the end of the energy is infinite, would be, you know, to, to modify the growth of W um, for large N to be some quadratic. I mean, it's coming, it's just coming from the fact that W is quadratic in the great extent. But you're talking about when the gradient then is infinite. And there's no reason to suppose that an energy function which is quadratic in the gradient of n is going to be good when the gradient of n is infinite. The other thing, Frank, there is that somehow linearization, which is that's why it sort of gives it some kind of quadratic, in some sense, it's like that. So, so that's a radical thing to do, which I still think is quite a, quite a good thing to do. One or two people have proved some results about, about that kind of theory. Uh, of course, you can you can you can easily you can easily keep W exactly the same for the gradient of n less than a million, right? and then you just the larger values of the gradient of n it just goes linear instead of instead of sub quadratic. So there's no way you would tell the difference. So, so that's one, one kind of way of doing it. Uh, there's another way we, we, we can try and understand these nine defects, um, which will come to. Now, something which is uh, interesting uh, in general in the progress of variations is the, is the Lagrangian phenomenon. So, this um, says that minimizers of the same energy in different function spaces can be different. And give different values uh, for the minimum energy. And then the consequence of that is that the function space is part of the model. And here's an example from solid mechanics. You have, you have, a, ball of, you have a ball of rubber subject to outward radial boundaries, and we, we model it using nonlinear elasticity. So here's the, the ball is, is um, that's the ball, and then we're going to take this point and put it out. There, right? Well, rubber is almost incompressible, but it doesn't like that at all. Um, so, so now, what have we what have we used as a function space smooth maps? Well, nothing will happen because it's incompressible. And you just can't put it out like this. You can say exactly where it is. You can't change the one. But if you're working in smooth functions, the answer is uh, it's a uniform dilatation. The map is the identity. What if, what if I use H1? Well, then you can, uh, you can create a point defect at the, at the origin. So you force out a hole. And that, and that actually happens. It's exactly, what, it's, it's exactly a failure mechanism in rubber that it fails by cavitation, by forming, by forming holes. So you get point defects there. But now, if, so this function space there would be H1. But now if you want real fracture, so that it really cracks over surfaces. Uh, so you have surface defects. Then, then you then, then you would use the the, the, the function space SVB, which is special functions of bounded variation, which, which allows this kind of this kind of jump. And so you see, you have three different function spaces, and you have three different solutions. Even though the energy function that you're minimizing is in some sense the same. You, you just change the function space and you get different different predictions for the model. Well, 
For liquid crystals, uh, one example is due to Hart um, and Lin of a one constant case, and they, and they show that the smooth boundary map, right, right, which is a degree zero actually, uh, um, such that the minimum among H1 uh, maps uh, is, is, um, is uh, strictly less than the, than the minimum over continuous maps in H1. If you they were two function spaces, so H1 and continuous functions in H1. Um, so and yeah, you get different parts. Another example, which we'll come to later, is uh, to allow the director to be discontinuous across surfaces. These are sort of surface defects or wall defects. So in this case, you should pay an energy penalty for a jump in the end. And so you would have to have some kind of augmented functional, which was the Osane Frank um, plus some. So if you're, if you're in this space SBV, uh, there's a well defined jump set across which n is. If n can jump, it's called, it's called SN, it's the jump set. And now, if it, and it also has a well defined normal, and that's part of the theory of this uh, function space. And it has well defined limits on either side with respect to the norm, n plus and n minus. And so you would add to this, um, to this uh, I, I, I of n some integral over the jump set of a function of these uh, three variables. So this is a way of, of trying to model uh, uh, wall, wall defects. Um, and, and, and they are. Um, and they occur in general at very small when, when you have sort of um, your very small landscape, got things that you're forcing to happen at a very small landscape. Okay, so I think that uh, that's probably a good place to uh, stop for, for today. Try to answer questions. So, the last one is the here. This Oh yes, so the, the gradient is the absolutely yeah. continuous part of these. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Which is kind of yeah, and also so uh, the planar one, so uh, the Yes, Okay.